Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. I hope everyone had an enjoyable lunch and got to go outside and explore some of the close by places or even get into Bethesda and the Bethesda Row area. So this afternoon, we have our panel on testing. We have some representatives from independent laboratories discussing issues seen with testing. We have three speakers this afternoon during this session. Our first speaker is Luann Spiritu. Luann Spirito is Director of Technical Support Soft Lines at SGS, Consumer and Retail, where she leads a team to develop comprehensive testing programs, performance specification, and provides regulatory testing guidance to global U.S. clients. She has a Bachelor of Science in Textiles from University of Rhode Island and over 20 years experience in the textile and apparel industries. She has pre previously worked for a U.S. testing company as a textile lab supervisor. She worked as a quality assurance manager for AMC and Calvin Klein and was VP of quality and production at Frederick Atkins, a New York buying office. Luann is an active member of AATCC and ASTM and sits on several technical committees in these associations. She is also an active member of the product safety committee of AAFA and she chairs the SGS Global Compen Competency Support Center. Luann is a frequent presenter at industry seminars and conducts training workshops for apparel and footwear testing. Our second speaker this afternoon is Pratik Ichaporia. Pratik is a frequent speaker and author on quality, safety, and environmental issues affecting the textiles, toys, and hard lines industries. In his capacity as Director of Technical Services, Pratik provides counsel to Intertech customers about compliance with and changes to regulations related to consumer product safety, chemical management, and harmful substances. He is an active member of ASTM Committee D13 on textiles and F15 on consumer products. He holds a PhD in fiber and polymer science from North Carolina State University and a master's of science degree in fiber and polymer science from Clemson University. Our third speaker this afternoon is Ellen Rowaldi. Ellen is a senior technical consulting specialist in the soft lines area and has been with Bureau Veritas Consumer Product Services for 25 years. In her current position, Ellen is responsible provi for providing support globally for clients as well as internal operations. This includes training clients and staff in testing theory and methodology, consulting, auditing, and advising on technical information, reviewing and authoring procedural client manuals, and interpreting test results. Allen holds a Bachelor of Science in Textiles from Philadelphia University. She is a member of AAFA, ASTM International, AATCC, and the Canadian General Standards Board, Canadian Apparel Federation, and the International Betting and Law Officials, and the ISO U.S. Tag Secretary. Ellen also is the designated trainer for ASTM training courses for apparel flammability and children's sleepwear compliance. Ellen also serves on the industry advisory board for the textile program at the State University College at Buffalo. So we have three distinguished speakers during this session. I'm going to turn it over to Luann. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we all know that this regulation for children's sleepwear has been regulated for many, many years. Um, however, there are still lots and lots of challenges with this regulation. Um, you know, part of it is due to interpretation of the regulation itself. Um, there are always new developments in styling. So, you know, one day we see all of a sudden a type of a garment that we haven't really <coughs> seen before. We see these, you know, sleep sacks that they use for, for young children. Then you see sleep sacks with no bottom, just legs hanging out. You know, it's always a different kind of a style coming up that sort of challenges how are we going to uh, categorize this product? Is it going to be a general wearing apparel? Is it going to be a, a sleepwear style? And then there's also, you know, innovative uses of fibers and materials. So there's a constant change in the way that, you know, products are being made and sold. And the regulations at the time when these were written, some of these things probably weren't even, um, you know, in play or considered. So as a testing laboratory, we get lots of questions um, about the regulation. 
and sometimes it's about the testing that's done, sometimes it's interpreting the styling of what needs to be tested. So what I did was I thought maybe we should just talk about some of the frequently asked questions that we get um, and provide some answers. So if I'm testing a finished garment, so this is one of the issues that happens is our, our client says, I have a, just want to test the finished garment. I don't want to have to go through all these testing stages because in the end, that's what's going to get tested is the, the finished garment. So the question is, why do the fabric and prototype samples also have to be tested? So basically, in order to ensure that the fabric and the garment construction are acceptable before the production begins, each fabric and different seam type and trim that's used in the production has to be tested. So if you have a fabric that doesn't pass, it really doesn't make any sense to go into production and test, make, make your whole production and then test it and find out that the fabric is failing because the whole, the, the whole um, production will have to be uh, discarded. So it's only practical that you would test it sort of uh, in stages. So if, you, if you're selecting a fabric that's not really suitable for children's sleepwear, um, it, there's no point in, in making up the, the garment. So when you have something like 100% cotton that's not treated, if the designer doesn't really understand and that's the fabric they choose, it's never going to pass the test. So it's important that you select the fabrics that are going to work with the test method. So in order to verify that the fabric that you select is correct, it has to be tested pre-production. And the same is true for the seams and the trims because the sewing thread that you use, the stitches per inch, the type of seam that you use in the garment has a big impact on how the sample will burn. So even though the fabric passes the test, depending on how it's stitched, it may no longer pass. So it gives you an opportunity before you go into production to make any changes that need to be changed. So you mean, may need to change the sewing thread or the um, uh, stitches per inch that you're using or even maybe the seam configuration um, itself. And then, of course, the production garments have to be tested because this is verifying the results that you had in the pre-production testing. So you should have all passing results before you get to the production uh, stage. So once you're there, you want to verify now that, you know, the, the actual samples that are being made are, are going to pass the, the test because you know that there's a lot of things that happen during a production. So lots of changes occur, not necessarily intentional, but things can happen, things can change that can affect the um, ultimate outcome. Okay, so another question is, does every FPU have to be laundered 50 times? So if you have multiple FPUs in the same production or style and you have no flame retardant uh, finish on the fabric or any chemicals added to the fibers or yarns to make it uh, flame retardant. Then you test the first FPU in the original and after 50 launderings. And if that passes, then the su second and subsequent uh, FPUs do not have to be laundered um, 50 times. So it's only the first, the first one. Now, if you have a flame retardant finish or chemicals that are applied, then all the FPUs must be tested in the original state and after 50 launderings. Okay, another question. Can fabrics of different colors or different print patterns be tested in the same FPU and GPU? And we had talked about this a little before already, um, but in order to include different colors in or different print patterns, you have to test three samples of each one to confirm that the performance is equivalent to, uh, to, to each other. So they can be treated as one FPU with some testing involved. Um, but however, you cannot combine the solid colors and the print patterns in the same FPU. Do the three samples that get tested of each different color or print pattern need to be laundered 50 times or can they be considered as subsequent FPUs? We have the same base fabric, but now you've got the different uh, prints on it or different colors, but the fabric itself is, is actually the same. So 
In order to show equivalence in the performance, three samples of each color or print have to be tested in the original state to show that there's no difference. So then the colors and the prints can be considered as subsequent FPUs. Now on the GPU testing, it's actually the same. So different solid colors or different print patterns of, of the same fabric can be included in the same GPU as long as three or more samples are tested and don't show any um, significant differences. And again, they cannot be combined. So the solids and the print patterns have to be treated um, separately. Okay, this is a biggie. Because as a laboratory, you know, we're always asking for samples to test because we need something to work with. And the, the clients are very reluctant to send too many samples in. So they're always asking, well, how many samples do I have to send? One thing is they have to know how many they need to send because we don't, they don't want to slow down the process. So if, we don't, if they send in half as many as they need, we're not going to do anything with it until we get enough to work with. So it's not a simple answer. So unfortunately, we would like to be able to say, oh, send us five samples, and that's good. But there's a lot of different factors that are involved in how many you need to test. So the amount of uh, the units in your production is one factor. The amount of fabric that you're using in the total production is another factor. Um, and also the size of the garments plays a part in how many samples you, you actually need to do the testing. So to try to make it um, uh, simpler to understand how to figure it out, because I can't give you a set number, which I know is what people would like to hear. So you have to be able to figure out how many samples you, you need to test. So we have this nightgown. So this is our sleepwear style B5698. We're making 24,000 garments. Two yards of fabric is required per garment. So the total fabric amount is 48,000 yards. So each FPU is 5,000 yards of fabric. So based on that, the number of FPU tests that have to be done are 10. So we're doing 10 FPU tests for, for, this, um, for this production. So now you need four yards of fabric for the testing. So you have to take a sample from the beginning of the FPU and another sample from the end of the FPU. And it has to be tested, the first FPU has to be tested in the original and then after 50 launderings. And one sample is five specimens. Okay, so now we have the prototype seams and trims that have to be tested. So let's assume that we tested the fabric and everything passed and it's good. So now we're going on to the next stage of the prototype seams and trims. So, you know, we still have our 24,000 garments. We did our 10 FPU tests. So the seams in this garment are overlock seams and single needle seams. So each different type of seam has to be tested. For trim, we have rickrack and we have a bow. So we need to do four prototype tests because we have two types of seams and we have two types of trim. So the total prototype test is going to equal four. So for the seams, we need to have 15 specimens of each seam type and 15 specimens of each trim type. And then, of course, you know, I'm oversimplifying it because when you do the testing, depending on how the, how the specimens burn, we may have to test additional specimens. So the worst thing that happens is you, you send in a very limited number of samples, and then the way the sample burns, it requires us doing additional burns. And now we don't have any, any specimens to work with. So it stops the whole testing process because we can't continue with it, and it's a big delay. Um, in you getting your test results. So it's really important that when you submit the samples, it's not even just the amount that you try to calculate. You have to also anticipate that if, if you have samples that burn the full length, more have to be tested. So we need to have those actual um, samples readily available to do the testing. And that's the same for the fabric um, stage also. So now in the production garment testing, we have all our prototypes done. Now, the maximum number of units in a GPU is 6,000. 
So the fact that we're using, we're making 24,000 garments, we need four GPU tests for this particular style. So we have to test three samples of the longest seam type. So that's 15 specimens. So whatever is the longest seam type in that style is what has to be tested. And we cannot take more than five specimens per garment. And we only test in the original state if the uh, fabric was tested uh, 50 times. If the fabric was not washed 50 times, then the garments have to be washed uh, 50 times. Okay, so this is just a little example of how this works. So in this style, we have um, the longest seam is the side seam on the top. And we can only cut one specimen from the side seam because of the size of the garment. It's only big enough for us to get one, one specimen from. So we need a total of nine garments. So we need the three samples, and we need five from each one. And you cannot mix specimens from samples. So whatever your sample set is, all the specimens from that sample set have to be tested as one group. So you could see at, for the third one, there's an extra one. But we can't use that one in that sample because I mean, we can't use it in the next group because it has to come, they all have to come from the same um, set. So a total of nine are needed. And this is not counting if we have to burn extra, extra specimens. So we actually need more than that because if any of them burn the full length, we have to do additional tests. Now in this case, the longest seam is the side seam. But the side seam is long enough for us to get two specimens from each side seam. So in this case, we only need six garments. So you could see that there's not a simple answer to how many garments do I need for testing, because it depends on, on the type of garment, the size of the garment. Um, because if it's a very small size, you can't get a, a long seam. You may need to take, get more. So that's how we ended up with nine garments in the other um, example. Okay, trim. So we know that we have to tr do the trim that, like the rick rack and the trim that, you know, is all over the garment. But then we have some trims that are smaller, like bows and appliques. Um, the trims definitely have to be tested. If it's a small trim, then it, it, it is considered exempt. So if it's less than two inches in the longest dimension, it's not tested unless it can, it, 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 there's enough of it that there's over 20 square inches in the item. So when you have on that nightgown, in that example where we had the bow, the bow looked like it was more than two inches. So that bow was counted in as having to have prototype testing done on it. Things like uh, zippers and buttons, elastics, you know, functional uh, structural parts of the um, sleepwear do not have to be tested. So that's all I have here. And I don't know if there's questions if you want to wait until we do the, que the question answer. OK. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks, Allison, for the introduction, and Mary for the invitation to discuss our, you know, one of the favorite topics of sleepwear flammability. And uh, not only today, but I think uh, your su support from you and your staff throughout the answering a lot of questions that we field. Uh, as as uh, Luann mentioned, you know, we we get a lot of questions from um, brands and uh, manufacturers. Um, uh, we serve a lot of times as the front lines. Um, especially a lot of times not necessarily um, as they're hesitant to answer, ask questions because a lot of times they are working with their product design and development stage and so they may not necessarily have all the pieces of the puzzle. They might be thinking about certain designs. And so, you know, as Luann mentioned, when they are innovating, um, not necessarily making the same type of garment because you see fast fashion where people want to have newer styles, newer type of garments, um, that raises questions in terms of especially with the sleepwear, 
is it going to be tight fitting especially it comes into more tight fitting arena where people are always trying to you know um, bend it but not break it type of thing <laughs> so they're trying to um, you know just get to the edge of things so there are always questions in in, in terms of interpretation and uh, we thank Mary for you know always being available for us <laughs> thanks um, so we'll talk um, generally uh, as some about the tight fitting sleepwears um, some overall comments um, about both the types tight as well as loose fitting uh, some case examples um, of the designs that we've encountered where we had to um, you know we, we received those questions uh, specifically about classifications in terms of how would we classify what would be the applicable requirements so on and so forth and then finally with some recommendations so here just to start off in terms of the LOAs and uh, these were uh, broken down specifically just for the sleepwear uh, for the last calendar year as well as for the first three quarters of this year um, and as you can see there are, I think the total LOAs for this period were about 2800 or so so sleepwear were about give or take 3 percent the major majority of it was for lead um, but the key criteria to pay attention here is not you know that there were violations just for the flammability standard itself but there were also for the labeling as well as for policy and other aspects as well. So the key is definitely meet all the safety requirements, but you know, in addition to that, you also want to make sure that you meet this dimensional as well as all the other requirements that are applicable to the standard. So of these LOAs, um, I think 60% were led to recall, 11% were stop sale, um, about 30% were for correct future production, and most of the correct future production, I think, which I think Mary alluded to a lot earlier was you know some of the minor things which might be labeling or things on those lines which could be uh, fixed. So with tight fitting sleepwear, um, just generally um, commenting on these, I think in terms of f as you start off with any product, first and foremost, uh, the most important question is the classification, and this goes for I think any product um, that is going to be offered for sale as a consumer product because as soon as you put something into a children's product bucket you have a lot more set additional set of responsibility that you have to meet. With apparel, it's a lot more easier because you go by the sizes, so it at least is relatively easier. You're not going to the intended use and the age grade and those type of things. Um, but still, it's, it's very critical in terms of the classification. Is it a children's product? Then you get into the apparel. Then you say, oh, is it really children's sleepwear? And what type of children's sleepwear? Because if you misclassify something um, as tight fitting, uh, which would have been loose fitting by based on its design then um, as has been referred to earlier you're using 100% cotton something without finishes um, or rayon in certain instances those fabrics are not really going to meet the requirements so first and foremost understand the classification because that is going to drive these requirements and again we are talking federal but you also have state requirements as well so if you do have loose fitting or some of those things you also have to think about uh, a lot of the chemical restrictions that might be coming through um, federal agencies as EPA or state um, regulators. Once you get to the design, uh, create specifications not only of the, you know, the, the dimensions of the garment, but also in terms of the size, what are the tolerances that you might have around those. So whenever you are allowing those, building those, make sure you have enough safety margin built in because even if someone exceeds some those tolerances, you know that you'll still be within the you know uh, still be able to meet the applicable requirements for the dimensional specifications. The other aspects are especially when you get into the loose fitting area and things like those were in terms of the fabric classification, construction of the fabric, what type of fabric are they using, um, content of the fabric, knit versus wovens versus threads per inch, all those type of information, and Loose fitting, you also get a little bit more in involved because you're not only thinking about the fabric and the specification, but also the sewing threads and things like that that you're using. Um, not just the type of thread, but also the thread count. Sometimes it might be the, you know, the thread, the type of twist or twist per inch could lead to differing results. Um, if someone is using lubricants so that the thread doesn't break during sewing operations, that could influence or lead to variability in the testing results. So when you're creating specification, create detailed spec because if you're not governing what they have to use, that means that you are giving them the freedom to choose otherwise. So that's the easiest way to look at it. 
Um, once you create this specification saying, here is what we want to manufacture, here is what we will use to make, make those products, um, evaluate the manufacturers um, in terms of what are their capabilities. Uh, in term, can they make these products? Have they been making this for a while? Uh, is this something new that they have? If you have tolerances around your spec, do they have appropriate controls in place where they will be able to meet those specs? Um, because if you can create a spec, but if there is no way to quality correct or evaluate those specs, uh, or if they don't have a way to control those specs, you know that there is going to be variability and you might have to in do a lot more interventions to make sure that you know, your production is going to be able to meet the requirements. And think about it from the larger perspective of children's products, the 1107 testing and certification rule. When you are creating your reasonable testing program, you are creating it for lead and phthalates, and if it's for under four years of age, three years and younger, um, and then you're creating for flammability testing. Do also something similar for the tight-fitting sleepwear in terms of the number of interventions that you might perform. Um, you know, Mary alluded to like 10 is a number. Right? I mean, so you, that, that's probably maybe a good number to go rather than just taking one snapshot saying, here is what it is, because if you measure something, a lot of times you might have measured something at the pre-production or front of the production. You probably didn't take something in the middle or the end. And so if you manufacture it over a period of time of days or weeks, things could have shifted from center to up or low. So how are you accounting for those? How are you accommodating for those changes? So take snapshots. And if you are taking snapshots, take it along the production, not just at one end of it. Um, just to get a representative sampling uh, of those things. So, you know, build those things in. Um, and then, again, doing statistical sampling. And I think the other point was that just about the specifications, I think, um, where now the ASTM D1355 has the standard um, for the sizes. And I think because the Department of Commerce gave that up um, because it was good at getting to the private sector. So I think that might be something by reference. Or, you know, that might be because, as, as I think, you know, was in the panels earlier, people are, they might be buying larger sizes just to kind of get around, um, you know, the same size, and that be the purpose of building safety into the products. So some specific examples uh, for tight fitting uh, styles. So can a garment, if can you design something which might have a footy? Um, so the answer would be yes. In in, in this case, you know, you can have a footy. Um, and that could be a part of the design as long as the garment meets all the specifications uh, for the sizes. For the footies, if it has an, you could have with elastic or without elastic. So if you have elastic, you would perform the measurement at the elastic in the relaxed stage, laying it flat. If you don't have it, then you're going to perform the measurement uh, one inch above the seam. So you're still performing the evaluations for the specifications making sure you are meeting the requirements, but at least that is an allowed criteria for designing. Right inside, can you have a hoodie as a design element? And I think Carly, Carly mentioned earlier that you know you can't, the reason being you know the requirement is you can have something that is attachment that's greater than six millimeter uh, from the point of attachment and hood would definitely exceed that. A lot of times you might even see hoods with antlers and things like that. And so you know again, that's again one of those design no-nos that you, if you are trying to go somewhere where it's a tight-fitting sleepwear, you won't be able to meet those requirements. So left and side hoodies allowed. Hoodies, it, it can't be a tight-fitting sleepwear. In that case, it's going to be classified as a loose-fitting. So again, if you misclassify that as a tight-fitting and you use cotton or rayon, it's not going to be able to meet the requirements. Some more uh, questions about the design aspect of it in terms of if you have large pockets you know, like something that stretches across in the front or back where you might provide like a kangaroo pocket pouch kind of thing. That's probably, you know, I mean, you can perform the evaluation, but, you know, if it's from the point of attachment, if it exceeds that six millimeter, it's not going to meet that requirement aspect of it. So, again, do a consider, uh, careful review of the design and see any time that you have an attachment that you are able to meet that six millimeter spec. Um, Sleep sack. That's I think a very common question that all of us uh, all of us get in terms of how do you classify sleep sacks? Or you know you get it in different versions, the cocoon version, the sleep sacks, the wraps, different terminologies, different names, uh, similar type of design. Um, I think in in that instance, um, 
you probably don't need, we need a lot more than just the product or the design. And I think at that point you have to evaluate on a case by case basis, but you also have to kind of evaluate the whole product. How is the product designed? How is it marketed? Where is it sold? Those type of things. Um, general rule of thumb, I think, is in terms of if you, if you have a product like a sleep sack or a wrap, if a baby is going to be with clothes inside of it, then that's probably going to lean more towards a day wear or not a sleep wear. But if it is something where a child would be just with, uh, with their underwear or a diaper, it's probably going to more lean more towards a sleep wear category. And also the other aspect of it is even if it's not a, you know, uh, for under nine months or nine months or under age, you also have to meet that length restrict, uh, the length restriction as well, where you can exceed that 25 and a three fourth of an inch as well. So you have to be mindful of that as well in terms of how long is that as well, if it's for, you know, three months old, six months old, uh, or nine months old uh, as well. So be mindful of not just, you know, looking at one thing, always take a step back, look at the, look at the whole picture. And then labeling is another common one where uh, if you do have some garments that are going to be sold, um, if it's in a package where you can't see hang tag or anything on those lines, you'd have to put that information up there on the packaging itself. Now uh, you see a lot more online as well. So you, you know, if you, if you, the consumer is not going to have the information by physically looking at the product or a picture of it, then you need to provide that information, convey that up front to the consumers. Some of the other uh, styles, boxer sets where you know you don't have the full length um, uh, for the bottoms. In that case, I think as uh, Carly mentioned, you kind of see in terms of the design tapers or not. Um, so you evaluate for the tie measurements and then you kind of look down, roll down and see is it tapering in design. If it is, then it's acceptable. If it opens up a lot of times, especially when you get to um, girls' garments, that would not be an acceptable uh, design criteria. Lounge sets. Um, like those that also would be allowed if you have like a short shirt or sleeves that's that's okay you know, as long as it meets appropriate uh, design specification criteria and I think a lot of times people compare between the CPSC manual and the Health Canada guidance and there are some there are some differences you know the Health Canada manual a lot of times will say you know for example but pockets you need to have the pockets, you know, either you need to have a Velcro or a button or something to close that. The CPSC manual is not as prescriptive. It, it just basically says if it's, you know, attachment or something on those lines, it can't have more than, uh, you know, six millimeters um, from the point of attachment. So there are distinctions uh, between the two requirements. And even though they are similar, they are not identical. So, you know, flame retardance is another one where Canada requires toxicity evaluation. U.S. doesn't necessarily explicitly require it. So if you are selling in two jurisdictions, it's, you know, it's normal to compare them, but be mindful that compliance with one doesn't necessarily mean compliance with the other. Moving on to loose fitting, again, some of these overall comments in terms of the creating the spec, which has um, everything that you would want to control if you didn't say in it. That means it's open for interpretation and some manufacturer can change that attribute uh, or that element. Um, so. I think this one was covered a little, a little bit earlier, but if you sell accessories, um, it's highly recommended that you meet the uh, sleepwear requirements, but the requirement would be for the general apparel flammability, so it still has to meet 1610. And then prints and patterns, um, of course, you can, can't combine colors, but you can color, combine the prints and patterns as long as the burn characteristics is not widely different. So kind of what's significantly different, that significant is the key word. I, it's, there is no number around that significant term. So, um, finally, with some um, recommendations in terms of if you are creating these type of garments, what to look for, what to plan for. Um, I think the first point goes for both tight fitting as well as loose fitting sleepwear. Create um, create your specifications, even when, especially when you are creating specifications. Create my, you know your control levels, your action levels. Um, that is going to be way lower than your, um, you know, your thresholds. Um, so that I if something goes over that action level, you can take um, precautionary um, steps, intervene in between, and make sure that, you know, you're not exceeding the thresholds that are created for those garments. Um, always, as, uh, this goes for everything that is related to testing always. If you are taking one snapshot, or how many ever snapshot you are 
for the evaluation, always want to have a representative sample. Um, labeling is the other one. You know, make sure that it's there. Specify the sampling plan. I think you know, as part of your reasonable testing program, include that in your 1107. If it's component part testing for um, you know tight fitting, you can do that as well. Um, loose fitting again. Specify everything. It's going to be a lot more. Um, dense than your tight fitting because here you are specifying different types of trims that you'd be using, different types of threads you'd be using for stitching, different types of stitches, parameters for quality control of what you can and can't use and all those other things as well. And then finally, keep everything, uh, especially I mean for the loose fitting and those you do need to keep not only the reports but also the actual samples and some additional um, you know, uh, garments or fabrics that you can actually do testing for in case if there are any issues. So keep everything um, that you have uh, as a record as well. And I think I'll turn it over to Ellen. Hello, and thank you for coming, everyone. Um, it's good being here, and thank you, Mary Allison, for hosting this, uh, this seminar. I think it's very valuable. As a testing lab, we get many, many questions. And um, this, this regulation is very robust. It's, it's very detailed. So there's a lot of parties that contribute to it and making it a successful regulation and, um, and limiting the burn injuries out there. So, with that, um, I thought maybe I would discuss the role of the third-party test laboratories. So I wanted to add a little more comment to what has already been said. Very often, we have many, many questions that come into the labs, some of which are very high level. For example, can we manage the record-keeping requirements for a vendor or for a manufacturer? Can you define the type of sleeper based on the designs? So we very often are given designs at conceptual stages and um, are asked, is this sleepwear or is this daywear? Where does it fall? And we don't have all the answers because we don't have all the, the facts at hand. Um, what are the record keeping requirements needed for compliance? This is a very big question that I receive all the time. Um, how can we maintain our product files for compliance and can you maintain them for us? Uh, another one that comes up very often is can you train our staff? And very often we do do trainings to help facilitate the understanding of the regulation. But as a manufacturer and importer of record, you know your process the best. You have all the details of the manufacturer of that product and you're the person that needs to decide what is best for that product in maintaining and limiting the risk associated with it. So another question that we get is, my competitor sells this product in the marketplace. How come I can't? I can't tell you. Maybe it's because it hasn't been uh, reviewed by the CPSC at this point. Uh, certainly, I can give you an opinion of what I think, it, where it may fall. But I'm not the last final say in this matter, you know. Uh, we have to turn to the CPSC very often for our information, and we ask for their support for interpretations. So what is our lab role? The lab role can audit the factories. We can look at factories, determine if they could possibly produce the garments the quantity, the volume that is needed for the production. We can also do fa uh, factory audits and, or social accountability on the uh, factories. Uh, and of course, we do the testing. So the testing that we do is basically an audit for you. You know, we can do size spec verification at the laboratories. Uh, we can test every 5,000 linear yards for FPU. Prototype seams and trims we can test, but it's all dependent on what you send us. Uh, the GPU testing, the same way. We can do the GPU testing, but we don't know if you have submitted adequate number of GPU testings to satisfy the finished product going to the market. 
Uh, we can audit sample seal product. As you know, with GPU sampling, it has to be a rando random sampling uh, product as it's being produced and submitted to the lab. It cannot be a golden sample. So these, these are sometimes we are very often asked to go in and sample seal production so that we can verify that the product has been randomly selected. We can, um, we also have to return um, the tested samples. So if you look to the regulation, you look at what is considered to be record keeping. There's a lot of detail in the regulation and if you read through it, it has a lot of questions that you should be asking. Do I have documents to support all the details that are found in the regulation? What is a record? A record is not only the test reports that show compliance, but a record is your yield reports, your PO agreements, any agreements or manuals that you have submitted to your vendors um, and your labs, the contractual agreements uh, that you have signed with your vendors when purchasing supplies uh, to manufacture those goods. Uh, some of the other records that uh, may be considered are uh, production units. The, we talk very often about yield, but you need to know also the traceability of the components going into that garment and can you trace the components going into the finished garment and um, identify that XYZ lot of zippers has gone into so many thousands of FPU garments or GPU garments, I mean. So you need to have traceability records in-house in and the questions you should be asking yourselves as manufacturers and importers, do I have the documentation to support that? Uh, do I have, records are also uh, including tested samples and remains. Does your lab return the samples to you? Do you maintain them? Are they easily accessible? So in case you have a recall, you have access to them in a relatively quick time to prove compliance to the CPSC. So these are just some of the questions that I, I um, very often ask my clients and importers, and I can't answer these questions. The manufacturer or the importer has to answer these questions. Um, so the manufacturer role is to know your sourcing channel, tie in the loose ends, either through contracts or through your PO agreements. And very often, um, you know, uh, say a brand will issue a manual and will outline the roles of each party within that contract. So is that completely tied in? Um, the source or manufacturing of, of fabrics and trims and functional components do you have certifications for these components? Do they comply with the phthalates, the lead requirements? Or if flammability is required, are they compliant for flammability? If you, of course, have to submit samples for testing and label the product correctly. Um, but do you review your reports? Is there traceability of the FPU re, FPUs at the prototype seams and trims on those test reports for GPU. Very often the labs will have a test request form that requests that information, but we do not necessarily know if all the information is accurate or correct. Only you can. We're reliant on the manufacturer vendor to give us appropriate information um, to document so that there is more or less a chain of uh, re test reports to support the GPU. Uh, you own the CPC. You're certifying that product is compliant. And um, do you ensure that there are proper records that are maintained and accessible? Accessibility is a key. You know, where do you maintain these records? Are they easily acceptable? If you're sourcing overseas, who's maintaining and holding these records for you? So, the lab does not know the details of these contractual agreements in summary. Um, and we could not tell you the details. We can only give you the test reports that our hands touch. 
The lab is not always privy to the details in the vendor manuals. This is another thing. Um, you know, there are vendor manuals that you, uh, test labs have test programs in place. We don't know if you have vendor manuals that have been given to your vendors outlining the expectations with them. We have a test procedure that we have in place that we have to abide by, but we do not, um, we're not necessarily privy to all the discussions with the vendors in the manufacturing community. The lab is dependent on information accuracy at the time of, of submission. So if there is misinformation or there's not the detail that's needed on a test request form, certainly we cannot provide you with a test report to show the, um, the flow of, of documentation that has supported that GPU. The lab must consider traceability of test report information to be accurate. Another thing is now we have many, many laboratories in the network. If the testing is done at another laboratory, we couldn't go back and check and see if there's a passing report. So this is another obstacle to which we cannot really be responsible to, to say, okay, you are compliant as a GPU. It's your decision as a manufacturer or vendor to know that your pro you have all the test reports in place to support that, that product, that final product. <clears throat> and the lab also doesn't know how many, as I mentioned before, how many test reports are needed because we don't have the quantities that are needed for the fabrication um, from, the, from the start. And this just summarizes some of what I've already said, that, some, that the traceability of vendor certifications is not available to the lab. If there's changes in production and reworking a product, we would not know that unless you were to submit it and specifically state that on a test request form. So if this is a rework item, I, you know, we could not, if it's something that is failing and has been resubmitted, we don't always know if it's a rework item, in which case if it is a rework item, it has to go and be, the whole process has to be started again from the FPU stage. So we don't have that knowledge up front when we're testing. We, we test what we receive. And then the marketing of the product. We very often ask you, how is this going to be marketed so we can help you make a decision, but we can't tell you how to market it. Finally, how it goes to the market and what the final outcome of the marketing is something that's out of our control. And again, the traceability of prototype seams and trim in GPU. So what does the lab do? The lab does have to be ILAC accredited, which is a major feat in itself. We have to trace, have traceability for all our, our equipment, consumables, um, certifications on all of our equipment, verifications. Um, we have to have traceable documents throughout in order to get ILAC uh, accredited. We have to then apply to the CPSC for each location that is authorized to perform that test and which test that uh, would apply. In the case of children sleep where there's multiple tests. So we would have to test, we would have to apply for phthalate testing, lead testing, lead in scrapable surface coatings and sleepwear testing and 1610 testing depending on the styling. The lab must be knowledgeable of the test. We have to have our staff trained to understand so that we can be your eyes and ears. If we see something suspect, we got to be able to raise it up to you um, uh, to flag any issue going forward. Um, the lab must globally coordinate testing practices. Um, so we have to test consistently across the board. And that's very difficult when you're dealing with 40 labs with all different languages. So um, certainly we have to have documents and guidance pieces in place so that it's clear to everyone exactly how it should be done. We may assist in, uh, in obtaining um, interpretations from the CPSC. Certainly we, we 
we consider ourselves an extension. We, we're not trying to take the place of CPSC. We, are, we, we value and we try to endorse the direction we receive. So the lab participates in standards activities as well, as you can, as you can see. There's some things out there with the um, regulations right now with laundering, for example. We participated at AATCC where the equipment was being impacted, which is used for the laundering uh, procedure in the method. So we were very active in those uh, subcommittees to come to resolutions. And the lab also offers services to facilitate sample selection, factory selection, and can perform audits in addition to just the testing, as I mentioned before. So those are the roles, uh, the role of the lab. We are here as, as someone that can help the industry, but we certainly do not control it. Our word is not final. The CPSC and the law is the final um, gospel, if you will, and um, we, we are just trying to enforce uh, the regulation as it stands. Okay, so some of the records that you may consider for, uh, for documentation, so if you have a garment, certainly we have to look at some of the, uh, the purchase orders, know how many units are being purchased, the details of it, the silhouettes, the designs. Uh, of the uh, sleepwear that's going to be sold. Um, you need to know the shipment dates. Have you as a manufacturer and importer record built in enough timeline to allow for testing of this product? FPU, if you have to do 50 laundrings, it's not going to happen in three days turnaround time. <laughs> we get that question very often. Why can't you do this in three days? So um, <laughs> it's not possible. So it's not wash, 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 and one dry. It's wash, dry, wash, dry. So um, <laughs> the, uh, you, you need to know all your manufacturers and locations, country of origin agreements. Deal, you, you have to understand the customs uh, interpretation for country of origin. Um, GPU and number of units and the traceable FPUs and prototype uh, tests, how many are needed. The details of those, are they documented with your vendors? The manufacturing identification and style numbers and, and all the um, traceability of lots to finished product uh, for a finished a garment of sleepwear. And then of course your supporting documentation, do you have all the test reports and results? Are they all passing? in order to sell that sleepwear. For fabrics, it's very similar. You have to look at uh, PO agreements, styles and finishes. If there's any styles and finishes, who's providing it? What is the detail of that finish? Has it impacted the flammability performance? I can honestly say the more testing, the better. Not because I'm looking to make more money. <laughs> It's because if you are making a substitution or changing, you need to quantify it and make sure that it is compliant. The um, finishes to a, uh, to a fabric can have a drastic effect on the flammability performance, as can color. That's why color is such an issue. Um, the different types of seams. Seaming, I've seen seams that burns up like a wick. Seams are very, um, because of the openings and because of the actual seam design, you can pass uh, with a very, uh, you know, a little bit wider seaming, but if, if it's a, like, a, like almost like a wick on a candle, depending on the seam structure and the design, it can burn right up the full specimen. So you have to really test multiple times in some cases to determine which seam design is the best suited for that product. Um, garment specifications and sizes, random sampling selection plans. Have you docu documented your sampling? Because it's written into the regulation that you have to randomly select. Do you have a document saying that you, you, saw, you took out garment number 55, 75, 149, 
and so on and so forth in order to qualify and verify that the production has not changed through the entire lot. And then, of course, you have um, your um, details of additional sampling plans. If you have other sampling plans that you're using, if you've gone to a reduced sampling plan or a um, uh, tighter sampling plan, have you that documented properly and do you have the test samples to support those test results? And then, of course, labeling. Um, you know, part of the record keeping process is also having samples on hand. You have to have original samples, original fabric. You have to have original prototype specimens, your tested specimens and remains, and who's hosting it. I have some clients that have decided that they want all the samples maintained in the U.S. for easy access if there's ever a um, reason for a recall. And then are you auditing those records? That's another question. So um, these are all questions that you should be asking yourself in order to protect yourself and to show that you are, are compliant to the law. So in summary, the manufacturer or importer of record is responsible for the compliance of the law, including but not limited to the development of the approved designs, traceability, record keeping requirements, and issuing the children's CPC or children's product certificate. Thank you. Hey, thank you to our panel. We heard three interesting and different views. We do have some time for questions. So we will take questions to any of the panelists. If you want to write in, remember the email is jkent at cpsc.gov. Question in the back. For the garment testing for GPU, did I hear you say that you have to choose your GPU garments from the first FPU because if that was the only FPU where you did the wash test? Yeah. Okay. I, I don't think I heard that right. No, so I, think, I, was... I, think you, I think you misunderstood. I'm sure I did. So when, when we're talking about the FPU testing and combining prints or combining colors, we were saying that you have to test three separate samples in those different colors or prints to confirm that they're burning the same. And then only one of those has to get washed the 50 times. When you get to the GPU stage, the, the washing has already been done. So now you're just, you're testing each GPU that you need to do based on the quantity of um, garments that you're making. So, but the FPU number and the GPU number have to be linked. So in other words, it has to be traceability from when you, when you assigned an FPU number, when you're making GPUs, you have to know what FPU is associated with that particular GPU. Right, you have to be able to tie that through the process. But you might be testing for GPU garments. You might be testing for GPU garments that didn't come from the first FPU, so they are therefore not necessarily washed. If only the first FPU is washed, mm -hmm. and you're you're randomly choosing garments for GPU, some of your GPU garments will be from an FPU that wasn't necessarily washed that's like that's my question yeah okay well i don't know the answer i guess we have to maybe direct it to to mary because I, that is true right um but but the way the regulation is interpreted is that not everyone has to be tested in other, in other words not every fpu has to be washed 50 times correct so, so if you're selecting something that wasn't from the one that was washed then in the garment stage, it's not representative of the um, um, the one that was actually washed. 
that make that one I thought. Are you seeing in any of the labs a lot of chemically treated fabric for traditional sleepwear? Speaking of the washing, are you no. seeing much of that come in that requires the wash test for every FPU? No. I think I see none really. And I'm not sure, you know, it might be out there. Sometimes, we, like Ellen mentioned, we don't get a lot of information either. So sometimes we just get a submission and they say, test it. Um, we, ha we don't have a lot of information about, about what it is. But generally, we don't see things that have a, ch a chemical uh, flame retardant on them. Can I add to that? We do ask if there is a flame retardant finish applied to it. But we, um, very rarely is it ever mentioned. The other aspect of it is also in terms of, I think, just the, there are, if you look at it from the chemical restrictions perspective, those have also gone up from the states um, as well as at the federal level as well. So that's also contributing to that as well, moving away from uh, some of the use of the flame retardants as well. I mean, I think just in general today, people don't want chemicals anyway. So in addition to the fact that there's regulations for a lot of these flame retardants, in general, consumers uh, in not, you know, don't want chemicals. Manufacturers don't want to have extra cost of adding um, chemicals. So they, I think in most cases, they would just select a fabric that can pass the test rather than add a chemical flame retardant. Question in the back. You know, the majority of the industry today doesn't use FR yarn. So if it's not FR yarn, there are chemicals being put on the product. It doesn't mean that they're harmful. And very few fabrics, with the exception of the high loft fabrics, those are the only fabrics that are really using FR yarn because the chemicals can't penetrate it. Because when you start using FR yarn for basic fabrics, the cost is too expensive and the retailers won't pay for it. Right, and I think that's one of the reasons that we don't see a lot of it is because that it is an extra cost that's involved. No, I'm saying that basic FR fabrics are not being used with FR and yarn. There is a topical treatment that's being put on them, but they're not harmful chemicals. Yeah, no, not all chemicals that are used are harmful. Right, and it's not flame retardant, flame resistant. Big difference. Well, it, it, the interpretation in the regulation is that if chemicals are used as a flame retardant, whether it's flame resistant, flame retardant, that the additional washing has to be done. So there's not a distinction, in, in my understanding, be in the regulation of the type of chemical that's used. So if there is a chemical applied to uh, retard the burning rate, then the washing would have to be done because they want to ensure that it's not, that it's going to last for the life of the garment. Right. But all our garments that you're seeing are marked flame resistant, not flame retardant. There's a big difference between the two. Flame retardant, you know, that's, that's, that's when the first fabrics came out, marked flame retardant, but I don't believe it's flame retardant anymore. It's flame resistant. Big difference. Treated as though they were chemically treated? No, okay. Treated. Right. Therefore, it's not a topical, so it doesn't have to be tested for 50 washes for every no, FPU. For only the first FPU. Correct. Thank you. Any other questions? Any from the webinar? Any questions? 
Okay, we're going to move questions. Yes. <laughs> okay, so when you have a style that is like a sack, so not the baby sleep sacks, but you have a style where it's sort of a sack, it's for older children that they get into it and it sort of goes to your waist, and, but there's no legs in it, so your feet are not exposed, so you really can't walk around in it. It's basically something that you could sit in or, you know, lay in. So, but it wouldn't be, warm. it's not really sleepwear in the sense that it only goes up to your waist. It, it's not a full thing. So you probably have something on underneath it. So is this, in, would this be considered a sleepwear, loungewear kind of an item, or would this be considered general? The blanket with sleeves? sleeves? Is that what you're? Yes. No, it just goes to the waist. Just to the waist. It's like blanket. a half a sleeping bag, basically. Think of blanket. it that way. Yeah. The half sleeping bag, yeah, basically. Yeah, it's like a sleeping bag type right. thing. But, you know, you, you can't walk around in it because there's no, you know, movement for your legs or your yeah. feet. It, it sounds like it's a blanket. Like a blanket. Or a sleeping okay. bag type of blanket. So then you, you would expect it to meet the blanket flammability standard or? We don't have a blanket flammability no. standard. You can't walk around in it, so it's not general wearing apparel. Um, so that's why so it would be considered as a like a blanket. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I mean, I know that you don't have a standard, but the voluntary ASTM standard, most people try to you know meet that if it's a a blanket item. Okay. Thank you. Anything else before we move on to our last session? We will have another last question and answer in case you think of anything during this last session and any that come in on the webinar. So our last session of the day is what to expect when you are inspected and what to expect when your shipment is detained at the port. These are topics that are uh, that companies often do not have the opportunity to consider until they are experiencing such an event. Today we are going to give you the opportunity to learn the inspection process and the import cargo examination process at the port when your ship, shipment is stopped. I'll just give a minute for the new panelists to come to the table. Thank you again to the lab uh, representatives for our panel on testing. Appreciate all the information. Okay, what to expect when you're inspected. It is my pleasure to introduce to you two CPSC employees that are very experienced in their specialty areas. First speaking this afternoon is Ms. Jackie Martinez, Senior Product Safety Investigator from New York City. Jackie began her career with the CPSC in 1990. She is currently covering assignments in the New York City and New Jersey areas. Conducting inspections is one of Jackie's strengths as a senior product safety investigator, as well as educating industry leaders regarding the Commission's requirements and federal regulations. After Jackie, we will hear from Mike Giella. He is a compliance investigator with the Office of Import Surveillance at the Port of Newark, New York. He began Newark, Newark and New York. He began his career with CPSC in 2002 as a product safety investigator and has been co-located with CBP at the port since 2008. His experience in investigations and knowledge of our regulations and statutes is an asset in his examinations. Take it away, Jackie. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. CPSC investigators have authority upon presenting appropriate credentials and a written notice from the commission to the owner, operator, or agent in charge to enter and inspect at reasonable times and in a reasonable manner. Any factory, warehouse, or establishment in which consumer products are ma manufactured or held in connection with distribution in commerce. Any firewalled conformity assessment bodies accredited under Section 14 
F, 2, D, or any conveyance being used to transport consumer products in connection with distribution and commerce. Inspections are not usually scheduled in advance. The investigator will ask to meet with an officer of the corporation or the most responsible person on the premises. The investigator will present his or her credentials, a notice of inspection will be issued, and the reason for the visit will be discussed. I brought along with me an example of a notice of inspection for those of you who have, who have never been visited by a CPNC investigator or compliance investigator, just to show an example of um, the, what, what you should receive. So if you want to just pass it around. Uh, this was mentioned several times today during the presentations. It is unlawful for any person to fail or refuse to permit entry or inspection under Section 19A3 of the Consumer Product Safety Act. A violation of Section 19A3 could result in civil penalties on the CPSA section, so on and so forth. The failure to permit entry or inspections as authorized by Section 11B, 15 U.S.C. is also prohibited under Section of the Federal Hazardous Substances Act and could result in civil penalty under Section 5, so on and so forth. <laughs> what prompts a CPSC visit? Follow-up to an in-depth investigation. Potentially hazardous product was identified, but responsible firm is not clear. Manufacturer, importer, or retailer of possibly defective product was identified and additional information is needed to determine whether substantial product hazard exists. Ongoing voluntary and regulated product standards compliance monitoring. These are just some sources um, where we receive um, reports or incidents that prompt an inspection, hotline reports, public database and so on and so forth, the whole bunch of, we, do, we monitor the newspapers, we, have, we receive incidents through there, uh, we coordinate, um, we have contact with our fire and police departments, they submit reports to us involving a consumer product. Um, this is uh, how do you prepare for an inspection, if you are a manufacturer, retailer, or reseller of a consumer product, know what rules apply to your business. Being informed is being empowered. CPSC wants you, your business to succeed and your customers to be safe. We are a resource to educate you on the steps your business should take to comply with all safety rules. Review our business and manufacturing guidance on cpsc.gov. Watch our special presentations for industry from CPSC technical and compliance staff. Maintain good records. Document the history of products from initial design to current QC reviews. Implement a first class quality control system to ensure you meet U.S. consumer product safety requirements. Section 16B of the CPSA requires that a firm must provide all records, reports, books, documents, papers, or labeling which show or relate to the production, inventory, testing, distribution, sale, transportation, importation, or receipt of any product or component thereof. You also must provide the investigator with samples of the product upon request. You we'll also like to see or ask to see any factory area warehouse area, office area in which consumer products are manufactured or held in connection with distribution into commerce or any area where documentation is held which is needed to complete the inspection. The following information may be reviewed during an inspection. Trade and brand names of products, complaint history for products in question, Details of quality control and testing programs. Information regarding sources, suppliers of subcomponents. Product coding system description. Business structure. Product design history. Sales records. Review of applicable regulations. This was also discussed earlier today. 
penalties for non-compliance with an inspection. Section 19A3 of the CPSA, once again, it is unlawful for any person to fail or refuse to permit access to or copying of records or fail or refuse to establish or maintain records or fail or refuse to make reports or provide information or fail or refuse to permit entry or inspection. 18 U.S.C. Section 1001, Criminal Statute, falsifies, conceals, or covers up by any trick, scheme, or device a material fact, makes any material false, fictitious, or fraudulent statement or representation, or make or uses any false writing or document knowing the same to contain any materially false, fictitious, or fraudulent statement or entry. Will the investigator do any testing? The investigator may test random samples if the testing equipment is portable and available. Such testing may include XRF screening for lead, small parts testing, and or other product-specific examination deemed appropriate. We have thylate testers as well to do thylate testing on site. Collection of samples. CPSC Inspection Authority allows for collection of samples, component parts, materials, substances, products, containers, packaging, and labeling. Samples will be collected by the investigator personally at random from the firm's inventory within any of the firm's facilities. Multiple units are usually collected to ensure enough units are available for adequate testing. Affidavits. Investigators will obtain a signed affidavit summarizing the inspection which will include the following information, records obtained, samples collected, and statements made. Like I left my contact information should anyone have any questions or need to reach out to me. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, after you do an investigation, who ultimately makes the determination? Um, us investigators, we are there to collect all the facts and the information and the samples. Then we go ahead and send that off to our compliance division. And they work closely with the uh, lab and uh, our legal team, and they ultimately make the, the determination or decision on the inspection. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? Has anyone been inspected before here by one of I'm trying to see if I recognize any <laughs> from the New York City or New Jersey area. Yes. I used to work for um, a test. Many years ago. I was saying a long time ago. <laughs> Many years ago, we got a, a, a surprise visit. <laughs> there was the CPSC, and they were specifically looking for records for, at the time, there was a lot of flammability recalls for. Um, I think they were rayon skirts. You remember them? You was probably you. You probably came to my office. We were in the New York office at the time, so there were several of us there. Yeah, and yeah, and I totally remember. you know, so of course, you know, we were like, and we of course had all our ducks in a row. We had no, we, it wasn't a specific issue with our product. I think it was a general inspection of the um, companies who were making these kinds of okay. products. I don't think we had an actual issue with it, but I think that they were just checking to see that we had testing documents that we were testing. Right. Um, so I don't remember any negative outcome from it. So Usually, yeah, those are the ones we tend to remember, the <laughs> negative ones. <Yeah. laughs> okay. Anybody else have any questions? Uh, yeah, does term, do firms have to stop their operations uh, during an inspection? Um, we are there just to educate them and collect the materials and give them the information. We are not um, there to offer our opinion, suggestion, or recommendation. Um, we are not there to t put them out of business or tell them to stop making any product at that point. They'll hear from um, our headquarters whether to stop or not or continue. Understood. Um, where do firms have to keep their records in the U.S.? 
Um, we prefer that they keep their records at their corporate headquarters, wherever they um, maintain all their sales invoices and um, operational information. Because um, many firms, of course, have uh, distribution centers and or other warehouses and stuff, but we prefer at their corporate headquarters. And then one other thing I should bring up, um, you know, not that we're, we're in the electronic stage, a lot of times um, we ask for these records and um, they're electronic, of course, and they're not easily accessible. So we ask them, is there someone at the firm that can, you know, either access the system? Because us as investigators, we, you know, they're totally different systems than what we're used to using and we wish or hope that someone in their office can access those records for us. Thank you very much. <laughs>
uh, 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 exam is going to take place at. So uh, typically, uh, you might need to uh, address with your broker where you want to send the freight, depending on where you're located. Uh, CES, you'll also see uh, in a few minutes over the next few slides, a central examination site. Um, that's the actual warehouse um, that holds the freight when we do the examination. Here's part of our exam process in Newark. Um, we are physically, investigators such as myself, are physically what we call co-located with CBP or Customs and Border Protection. Um, I, my office space is literally right next to uh, Customs and Border Protection officers. Um, they're uniformed, they're armed. Um, we are available, there's four of us up in Newark, and I can only speak for our port. There are four of us up there. We are available every single day to do an examination. So CPSC exams um, do not uh, stay, get stale. They move more than any other agency. Uh, I'd like to think that we are the smallest agency that CBP deals with, but we're the most efficient because we are co-located there. Um, once cargo is offloaded from one of those huge ocean liners, um, that container um, does go through an x-ray screen by CBP, 100% in Newark, um, looking for um, WMD, weapons, et cetera, that kind of thing, more, more national security items. But then once that examination, or excuse me, that x-ray is complete, uh, if the shipment is flagged for a physical exam, it's going to go to a CES, a central examination site, which is a warehouse that we work out of. If there's no exam required, it's going to go the other way down the road um, and be released fully to the importer's uh, possession. Um, again, we are notified that a shipment is, is ready for full exam once the shipment is physically brought to the warehouse and the warehouse crew unloads the freight onto the warehouse floor. Um, there are a variety of reasons why we don't go into containers, either they're half stripped or quarter stripped. Um, so as a requirement, CBP um, requires 100% strip of those goods. That's the significant difference between some other ports where they don't necessarily require 100% strip. Once it's on the warehouse floor, uh, we will go physically out there and examine the cargo, again, by literally opening up boxes and, and conducting whatever field screening that's necessary, depending on the type of product. Um, if it's uh, a children's product, we're going to have a, a handheld XRF on site at the warehouse screening for lead, as an example. Possible outcomes of this exam. Of course, a full release is certainly possible. Everything's compliant, everything looks good. A release is, is, is conveyed to CBP the same day. Um, there's also a possibility of a sampling conditional release. That's a, a less likely outcome than the third one, simply because um, there's not a lot of situations that require that. An example that I heard before, uh, which is entirely accurate, is if there's a, simply a labeling issue or something of that nature, um, we, would, we would consider a sample and conditional release. Um, the third option, a sample and detention, is the most likely option if there are problems or potential problems. Um, and uh, there are some other possibilities, but those are usually unique in nature, and most of the time it's one of the first three. Um, when our cargo passes a CPSC field screen, uh, we will notify CBP again that day so it doesn't get stale of a, of a release. But you have to remember, and this is an important part, we are living in CBP's world. Uh, CPSC is our guests in their house, so to speak, as is any other agency. So we can verbally issue the release to CBP, but if CBP or another agency has a hold on it and they haven't done their exam, it's going to sit there. So although you might think that it's, oh, it's a CPSC-regulated product, I just spoke with Mike, he said it's good to go for CPSC, CBP may have an eye on it for something else. Um, and we have been instructed by CBP very, very uh, directly to not speak for them and to just speak on CBS, CPSC's behalf. So although it might be okay for CPSC, you may have to wait it out for another type of release from CBP or another agency. All right, this is the slide that you do not want to be on, but um, <laughs> it's certainly relevant. Uh, when cargo fails CPSC field screening, and again, depending on what product type it is, uh, depends on what type of field screening we're going to be doing. Um, a sample, a physical unit, and uh, the number of units depend on the type of violation, uh, will be collected by the investigator from the warehouse and be shipped down to headquarters in the lab and some different offices for further evalu evaluation. 
The product will typically remain at the CES. Again, we're, we're, rare cases we'll do a conditional release. For the most part, it's a sample in detention for a variety of logistical issues. Um, you'll get a notice of sampling detention, which is a, a generic a CPSC form, but it will have the specific information, the item numbers, the model numbers, the location of the warehouse, which you should already know, but uh, most specifically and most importantly, uh, the potential violation, the regulation that it has, a, has an issue with. Um, if we do not see the documents in ACE or we haven't reached out to you already, uh, a local CPSC investigator or technician who are kind of our behind the scenes um, uh, aides at the port uh, will reach out to you for the documents, specifically the entry package, uh, the CPC if that's, if that's relevant, et cetera. What happens to those units that were sampled during the evaluation process? Um, they're processed at the port. They're physically gathered from the shipment. Um, they're photographed. They're electronically recorded in an internal system, and they're physically packaged to go to headquarters in the lab. Um, different units go to different offices within CPSC, depending on the type of violation, and each office evaluates um, the product, uh, depending on what type of product, but ultimately it's going to come to a compliance officer's desk, and they're going to uh, have the final determination and discuss the results with the importer uh, about that sample. Final steps. Um, if CPSC headquarters uh, notify, will notify the local CPSC investigator of the determination, um, we will then notify CBP of the determination and what action should be taken. Most of the time, if we get to this point, it's going to be the third option. Now, I say most of the time, not all of the time. Because I find that um, if we're going to take the action of sampling and detaining a shipment, and our detention authority list lasts up to 60 days, which is different than CBP's, which is 30 days, and a lot of people don't realize that in the import world. If we're going to go through the trouble and the time and the money and the effort to collect that sample, an investigator such as myself is pretty confident that there's a violation there, and it's probably going to result in seizure. Um, we do make mistakes, of course. Um, some products have been incorrectly field screened, of course, but most of the time it's going to result in that third option, which is seizure. Um, once CPSC requests CBP to take that action, CBP and the CES and the broker and you guys, the importer, uh, will coordinate as needed what, what steps happen next. That was it. Any questions? Yes, Mary. Sure. Uh, sure. Mary asked about uh, a type of inspection that we do called an informed compliance inspection. The acronym is ICI. It's different than what Jackie spoke about, which is more of a full establishment inspection. We do also do full establishment inspections. Um, but an ICI was created and designed to um, reach out to a first-time violator, so to speak, someone who we really have no history with that may have had one bump in the road, so to speak, at import, and an investigator will reach out to that importer and offer a uh, completely voluntary uh, uh, educational uh, visit or even phone call, quite frankly, just to say, hey, do you know who the CPSC is? Um, do you know why we seize this stuff? Here, I'm the contact locally for you if you have any more questions moving forward. Here are some resources of how you can avoid future mistakes, that kind of thing. And again, that is a, a, a early in the process, um, primarily after a first violation. Um, if you're detaining some goods uh, from a firm, but not their whole shipment, yes, uh, is it possible for them to get the other part of the shipment that has not been detained? Yes, absolutely. Um, through your broker, um, you can file what we call a manipulation order um, with CBP. Your broker will know that form. They should know that form uh, rather well. And you can file that with CBP and the warehouse, and they will coordinate uh, that manipulation request with, with me as the detaining agency uh, or another investigator. And that will get approved usually the same day. And then the warehouse will segregate the detained items from the non-detained on your behalf and the non-detained will can get released 
under a, a, under a release, and of course the detention still remains, though. Yes. You mean the examination process? Yeah. Um, sure. Uh, she asked uh, what the time frame is between when um, a kind of a hold is placed on a shipment versus when I can physically look at it. Unfortunately, there is a, somewhat of a lag on the logistical aspect of it. Um, it is physically getting unloaded from a boat. Uh, going through the initial CBP screening, like I mentioned before, which is, which is you know, standard. Um, and then by the time it actually gets trucked to a warehouse and gets in line to be uh, what we call stripped out onto the warehouse, there is several days. So we get this question all the time. And I, actually, I want to say probably more than several days, probably 10 to 2 weeks, 10 days to 2 weeks. And it is simply a physical moving of freight and then once it gets to the warehouse, it stands behind in line for, pe for shipments that have arrived earlier. It's no more complicated than that. Um, we get this question all the time. You see an arrival date on your entry that might say the first of the month, and then the 15th of your month, you're like, why haven't I been examined yet? Meanwhile, we haven't even been uh, notified of the exam yet. It's not in our queue yet um, because of the logistics of moving it from point A to point B. Um, and, and I, I, I want to be clear that once that exam is presented to us because of our staffing in Newark and because of our, um, I guess, probably our dedication to also facilitating trade, it's happening. Our exams are happening every day. There's by no chance um, in Newark that you have to wait three or four days with your freight on the floor of a warehouse for us to examine it. It might be a day. It, it's literally hours. Um, the delay is moving from point A to B. You're welcome. Yes? How many ports do you have um, CPSC staff? I believe it's a great question. Uh, CPSC import, I'll give you a little history, started in 2008. This was when I came on board from, I was previously a, a, a domestic investigator. Um, we, I think, started with six ports, and now we're up to 18. Is that correct? 20, excuse me. I should. Um, a lot of the ports, they're single investigators, so they're a little more stressed in terms of their workload, and, but they're also slower ports. So larger ports have four people like Newark, and we, I think we have six in L.A., and, you know, so we're staffed up at the larger ports, mm -hmm. but it's 20 currently okay. of Thank the you. largest ports around the country. Um, assuming you have your goods conditionally released, what's the process look like after that? Um, you know, assuming that you, your firm goes through the process and has their goods For approved. reconditioning? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, typically, under that scenario, you're going to be in contact uh, with, at the very least, a compliance officer here at headquarters kind of coordinating that, who's going to approve that potential for reconditioning. Most of the time, it's going to be an investigator um, that's going to go out to verify that reconditioning in person most of the time. So at that point, you're going to be able to schedule that uh, around your reconditioning and the, way, and the time that you can do it, whatever has to be done, whatever's necessary. And we're going to arrive in person, um, again, at a predetermined time to kind of verify that. And then once that's verified, it, it usually happens, you know, very, very quickly within a, within a day or two. You can get a, even a verbal or a phone call from compliance saying that it's, it's good to go. Anyone else? Any more questions? Um, I've got one more. Uh, if um, if you have your shipment seized, if a firm has their shipment seized uh, due to a, a violation, a CPSC violation, why do they get billed from CES? From the the CES. Okay. Um, the CES is a private entity. They're a private business. Uh, CBP contracts out that warehouse space uh, at every port. So uh, you're not bringing your goods to a CBP warehouse. You're bringing it to a private warehouse. So the cost of the warehouse pulling those goods out um, at the time for exam, and then if you are detained and potentially seized, a daily fee 
um, to have your goods stored uh, during the detention process is why you're getting charged. It has nothing to do with CBP or CPS CPSC. We actually have no control over it. Um, it's a private warehouse that, that the government contracts out that they can utilize to do their examinations. So is it just the luck of the draw if your products go to the CES instead of being unloaded at a CBP uh, warehouse? There is own? no CBP warehouse, oh, okay. right? The, 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 um, the CES is a standard thing that happens at all ports, so right. any examination is going to go to a centralized examination site that CP, CBP contracts out where they have staff at. And that's actually where I and investigators such as myself have our offices at, so that's why we're there constantly at the warehouse and available. Um, if you're talking about targeting, that's a whole other avenue of why a shipment would be targeted. But there are no CBP offices, uh, warehouses. It would only be a CES. Thank you. Thank you, Mike and Jackie. So that was our last scheduled session. We are going to have a few more questions and answers. So I'm going to call the CPSC technical staff back to the panel. So Mary, Carrie, Paige, Linda. Okay, any more questions from the audience or on the web uh, before we conclude our seminar? One second. Um, Veronica Fay, AME. Um, you had said something about the beach robe and the, the cervical length. Uh, what it has to be to classify as a beach robe. Can you give us that? Or where can we get it? It's through the National Bureau, Bureau of... Uh, That's Bill Bill. Yeah. I have it. You can email me. Okay. I do have the chart. Okay, I thanks. don't know where you can find it. It's not on our website. It's through a different company. Scott Cohn from Aaron Fox. Um, I, have a, I just want to revisit the question uh, that I believe H&M had about um, labeling underwear, that, that is clearly underwear, uh, as not being intended for sleepwear. And I think the response from, from uh, uh, Carrie, if I'm not mistaken, was that uh, that really wouldn't be approved by the CPSC? We advise against it, yes. You advise against it, okay. So my question is, are there, I mean, are you familiar with any consumer perception panels or anything that have been uh, conducted to come to that conclusion, or is that just sort of an internal, uh, you know, thought process? I've had consumers complain to me and made trade complaints about, it's usually moms, like the mom uh, Facebook groups. A lot of them will message me complaining about it because they see that those garments are sleepwear. They don't understand why a company would have to put a warning tag stating to them that it's not sleepwear. It just confuses a consumer. And mm -hmm. I agree. I mean, to me, it seems like that it would be actually helpful to the consumer. It would be in line with the marketing. It would be consistent with the marketing of the product as not sleepwear, rather than sort of a reverse, you know. If we said that we advise for those tags to be on it. It would be on every single loungewear garment. Every robe would have that tag. Mm -hmm. Right. And that would be okay. a problem. But, but it's not, uh, I mean, if a company does decide to pursue that and, and, and label, it's not, it's not held against them necessarily, right? I Correct. Mean, okay. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, 
right, I got a couple questions from email. So, um, Angie Lucas was asking, uh, is it correct that a flame retardant is a chemical that makes a garment fire resistant? I think she's looking for clarification as to what exactly a flame retardant is. Right, flame retardant it is chemical that is added to change the flammability characteristic of a fabric. So are FRs permitted for use in children's sleepwear? There's nothing that restricts the use of them in children's sleepwear. The manufacturer has a responsibility to make sure that there's no toxicity associated with the use of a topical treatment or any other type of treatment that's used in, in a, a garment, a children's garment. The standard's a performance standard and it doesn't specify metrics are the way to meet the flammability requirements. So it's not prohibited, it's not recommended. There's no, it, the, the regulation's silent on the use other than saying that if you use it, you have to make sure that it's durable for the 50 laundries. Thank you. Um, what are the requirements for family pajamas? Here, you want to, well, family pajamas, that's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting category. The adult pajamas have to meet 1610, 16 CFR 1610, which is the clothing textile standard and the children's sleepwear has to meet the sleepwear standard. Understood. Is that it? Okay. With that, we will conclude the seminar. Um, we have a slide where there are available resources. Our website is always an excellent resource for additional information. We have laboratory manuals, of course, the Federal Register notices, the CFR, list of recalls, all other kinds of manufacturing information. We also have guidance documents. And here is the contact information for the CPSC staff that participated in today's seminar. So we welcome any additional questions that you might think of on your uh, journey after the seminar. I do want to thank everybody for coming today to the seminar to support uh, today's event, especially all the speakers and the panel events. Um, it was a very informative day with lots of information, so we send you a sincere thank you for participating. Is there another question? Just some more questions online. Um, Angie was clarifying that, sorry, Angie's clarifying that um, she wants to know the difference between flame retardant and flame resistant in reference to previous discussion. So flame retardant usually refers to a chemical, and the flame resistant is the performance term. Okay. Um, uh, there's also a question on here uh, asking whether or not the presentations will be uploaded onto the website. Yeah, or I will. Some yes, other. I will get to that. We will have those. Yes. So the short answer is yes. <laughs> so in okay. addition to the, all the other additional information that is available on our website, uh, we will be posting the presentations, so they will be made available. And we will also be um, issuing some type of follow-up document, um, depending on some of the feedback we might get. And as we review all of the information that was presented today and all the questions, we will be compiling some type of information, uh, some type of proceeding for today's event. So I'm expecting either a question and answer or a pamphlet or some type of summary report. So you can look forward to that in the near future. Our goal today was to provide an interactive session to assist the industry with compliance. Uh, we hope that we achieved our goal. We hope that you learned something that made the trip here worthwhile. Uh, again, we thank you for coming and participating. Uh, there's a few more weeks left in 2016. We're already in December, so I want everybody to enjoy the last month of 2016. Have safe travels. Um, again, our contact information is on the screen. We would like to hear any feedback that you would like to send us about today's seminar, about what you would like to see in the future, and any questions you might have. Um, so I encourage anybody to write in um, or contact us with that information. Thank you again, and have a great rest of the day.